Welcome to this week's Eccentric Minute, brought to you by Eccentric. This week's Eccentric Minute is a great exercise to get you out of the sagittal plane and into the frontal, and that is the K-Box lateral squat. With one leg off the box, you're going to give the wheel a spin and really sink into the hip of the leg that's on the box. While you're doing this, you want to try to keep that back leg straight to really stretch out those adductors and really drive your pelvis as hard as you can up and over to the side off the box. Make sure you give yourself a counterweight with this because when you give the K-Box a good push here, it's going to want to give a little bit. So make sure you set yourself up there. But this is really an awesome exercise, again, to get you out of that sagittal plane, open up your hips. Guys, give this one a try. I'm sure it's one you're going to love. I really hope you enjoyed this week's Eccentric Minute. Make sure you check them out at eccentric.com to find out everything you need about the K-Box and the K-Pulley. Being a strength and conditioning professional requires constant pursuit of better knowledge better methods, and better means. But what if there was a place where strength and conditioning coaches could learn from some of the most innovative practitioners in the world, such as Jeff Moyer, Lachlan Wilmot, William Wayland, James the Thinker Smith, and Kirwenham Flat? Well, you could find multiple lectures from each of these top-level coaches and a few lectures and examples from yours truly as well, all in the Strength Coach Network. The Strength Coach Network is going to bring you well over a hundred different lectures from some of the top practitioners in the world to be your one-stop shop for your continuing education and professional development. So hop on over to strengthcoachnetwork.com slash today and get your 48-hour trial for only a dollar. That's strengthcoachnetwork.com slash to get your 48-hour trial for only a dollar. I look forward to seeing you in the Strength Coach Network. Eddie, thank you so much for spending the time with us today. Thank you for having me. Yeah, man. I'm stoked for this because I think that when we get out of our comfort zone and talk about some things that we don't necessarily know too much about, it allows us all to grow a little bit. So I think that this is an episode that's going to help people kind of take a step back and, and look at things from a different lens. But before we get too far into this, brother, let's let everybody know who you are, where you're at, and, and how you got over there to the Netherlands. Yeah, of course. Um, my name is Eddie. Uh, I live here in the Netherlands, as you mentioned, uh, in Amsterdam. Um, I'm actually from uh, Bosnia, but it's a long story. I moved here uh, at a young age, and I consider myself to be Dutch. Um, I'm working, working as a strength conditioning coach in Team Handball, which is something... Um, I'm assuming most of your listeners are from America that you will be uh, less familiar with. Um, we'll get into that later. And I'm also working as a strength, uh, as a sports scientist with a three by three Dutch national basketball team as well. So taking a uh, few paths there. Yeah. And I think that first let's dive down this rabbit hole of handball, right? I think that this is a game that some of us, you know, got to play growing up like in phys ed class and stuff, but high level handball is a little bit different than, you know, when you're a sixth grader running around catching, pivoting, and then jumping over the line and throwing at the cage. Uh, yeah, it's probably a little bit different. Uh, in Europe, it's a kind of a big sport in some countries, not, not everywhere. Uh, soccer is of course the biggest. Um, Basically, it's a combination of uh, basketball and soccer, you might say to some degree, because you have a goalie um, and you have uh, six players in the field and you play, of course, with your hands. Um, you play with a, a smaller ball, um, so you can, uh, it's also as a big um, rotational component in it, in it, pretty hard throws. Um, and well, basically, it's six against six with a keeper on each side. And there is an area in front of the goal where you're not allowed to enter as a field player. So you have to shoot from outside of that area. Um, and it's, uh, it's also a pretty physical game. You're allowed to, talk, you're allowed to tackle each other. And um, uh, it's, it's a relatively small-ish field as well. So a lot of contact there. Um, and I think you see a lot of different actions due to, uh, due to different demands of the game. So throwing, tackling, uh, running as well, especially for the outside players. 
um, and the keeper, of course, is, which also uh, who also has different demands than the rest of the players. So let's get into that a little bit because I think that that's something that is always fun when we can look at what the demands are of a sport and start to peel the layers back of the onion of what training goes on and how this can be impactful for other sports because it's it, like I think the one thing that I would say about handball that maybe you didn't say that would be something that a you know the western audience needs to understand more is it's freaking fast like it's not like when you say soccer I think all too often people think soccer is like more of a pace sport right like there are bursts where you're going but more and often that it's pace but I would even say that it's more like like the idea of an indoor soccer or like indoor field hockey, how much faster it is than the outdoor game. Yeah, yeah, I think that's uh, that's a good something to add. There's a lot of pacing in there as well, but there are uh, pretty big bursts because you, uh, as same as in basketball, but you you attack and defend with six players, uh, and you go all the way to the other side of the field. So there are a lot of moments with uh, break situations. Uh, there's a lot of tempo switching in there um so yeah it's a pretty it's a pretty fast game as well um in that regard it's a bit different than soccer conditionally i guess um and because the there's such a high physical impact uh, same uh, as uh, maybe not as intense as with american football and rugby but you also tend to see that players do pace because those moments are when you do attack are pretty intense and the throws are different you know, we sit here and think as Americans is it's like step and throw, but a lot of the throwing or at least the more violent shots, if we want to say it that way, those are done with two feet in the air, correct? Yeah, yeah, they are because you have to shoot over the def uh, defenders as well. Uh, and what you also tend to see a lot uh, is uh, because there are defenders in, in front of you and you also have to aim uh, to get past and the defender and the goalie um that, that you see a bit a little bit more variation than um maybe the, definitely than what you would see in baseball um but yeah you jump in the air and sometimes you have to bend and uh or uh, maybe even do a falling movement when you throw between defenders uh, so you see a lot of the smaller players do that um and you tend to see to, to get a little bit higher in the air you tend to see a pretty big shift of the upper body in the air because then your arm of course gets higher in the air and then um that, that has some advantage advantage too so listening to this there's a lot of uniqueness to the game and there's a lot of intricacies that are very different than what we would be used to like when people sit here and they think of throwing they would think quarterback and think pitcher they would think you know baseball player but it almost sounds like that's going to end out being more similar to like a volleyball type action. Um, yeah, I think that's a pretty good comparison. Uh, yeah, yeah. So it's it's kind of like volleyball where you also have to get over the net, um, where you see also a lot of the uh, bending movement. Uh, here you also need to get past the defender as well. Um, and you always have the option to pass the ball, of course, to the players around you. So that makes it um, a bit unique as well. Um, and I think when we think about the strength conditioning part, um, you have differences between the roles and sometimes those differences are pretty big. Of course, the keeper from the field players, but also uh, you have a, a pivot uh, who is basically the guy in the middle who, whose job it is uh, to just push people around and he gets pushed around a lot as well. So those are the players who usually uh, benefit most from strength work. Um, and on the other side of the spectrum, we have the wings who are on the outside who run a lot of breaks. Um, and they basically have two jobs in the field. One is, uh, well, mostly, mostly they're waiting to get the ball. Uh, and when they get it, it's either they're running a break, which is a 20 to 30 meter sprint, uh, or they get the ball and they take two or three steps and jump and shoot. Um, so those, that, those have pretty different demand from, from the pivots who benefit more from hypertrophy work as well um, and then you have the middle guys who are uh, I guess move the most 
and maybe need the biggest aerobic base and do a lot of change of direction. So in that sense, sometimes that's what makes it a bit more difficult to manage load as well in some situations. So then looking at that, how are you evaluating those loads and how are you now modifying and building programming around the demands of those four different positions that you mentioned? Um, yeah, so that's a, that's a good question. Um, to, uh, to add to that, uh, something that makes my um, position currently uh, maybe a bit different from some people, probably recognizable for a lot, it's that it's a semi-professional team that I work with. So they have a, an academy who are there, uh, who make full-time hours. And those are the players that usually it's, it's easier to sh shift sessions and uh, train on different moments during the day. But with the senior group, um, it's not always as easy because most of the guys have to work um, part-time uh, next to playing the sport, um, which, which also adds a layer of complexity when thinking about the planning of training or um, what you're going to spend your adaptive energy on. So that's something that we try to consider a lot. Um, and that has pretty big implications for, uh, for what we choose to do. And I think the term um, efficiency is pretty, pretty important there. And we try to look at not always adding stuff, but because they already have a work schedule as well, and those schedules differ, how can we make sure that uh, we cater to the needs of um, each individual player in terms of uh, time to recover, loads, uh, but also what do we uh, spend energy and time on and what do we maybe uh, place a little bit lower on the priority list. Um, so for example, some of the players um, might really be lacking in the physical department and we might choose to uh, gear a little bit more of the training energy towards that goal while uh, some of the other players uh, who also work part-time uh, are maybe physically well developed uh, and have a lot of uh, a lot of the i guess uh, our metrics that we uh, that we pay attention to they're pretty well developed athletically and uh, in, a, in a movement sense um, with those we usually just take the approach to trying to focus on getting them as much possible uh, quality time on the field. Um, and we put the other stuff to the minimum. So I guess that, that's the most important to, uh, thing that we consider. Um, it's not very specific. Um, so um, maybe um, I, should, uh, I should dive a little bit into um, uh, examples of how we do that. Um, like, uh, like most other clubs, we uh, track um, RP, session RP, uh, we uh, discuss how we plan our sessions. We, we uh, work based on the game day model as well. So uh, we have a game every week and we try to make sure that we have a short recovery block after the game, loading block, and then we taper towards the game. Um, we have a pretty short off season. It's only, uh, if we're lucky, it's six weeks um and, but mostly it's four so it's tough to do a, an off-season block where we focus more on general training um so we have to we're kind of forced to uh, develop some of the younger players in season um so we tend to make we make three groups uh, basically so the group that always plays a lot and for them the priority every week is the match uh, then we have kind of an in-between group where we take a week-to-week -week approach, uh, discuss it with the staff. Are they going to play a lot this week? What is the probability that they will? Uh, and how much did they play the week before? And we adjust the training schedule uh, to fit that. And then we have a development group who will almost definitely not play with the main team. Maybe they'll play with the second team, uh, but it's a little lower on the priority list. And we tend to go a little bit more towards development. So we push them a bit more in the week um, and we stray away from the, from the game day um, periodization model. Um, so that's, that's kind of the big split in the groups. Um, and I think most, most of your listeners will be familiar with in team sports um, that you would uh, 
load them heavy, the heaviest in the middle of the week, and then we, you would taper toward a match. And with the development groups, we tend to uh, load them throughout the week. Um, and then maybe the match is a little bit less important for them. So you guys play one match a week? Um, most of the time, yes. Uh, but sometimes where there's uh, currently with COVID, there's no cup and there's no uh, uh, Euro games either. So it's only one match a week. Um, but usually uh, some weeks it's two, maybe even three. Three is uh, pretty unlikely, but um, two happens probably once a month as well. So that's kind of like UEFA and things like that when you'd be looking at it with football. Uh, it's, I think it's pretty comparable. Yeah. So in Europe, you have your, uh, your national competition, which for us is a Dutch plus Belgium competition. Um, so they, they kind of added those two together to make a bit of a, a higher level competition. Uh, and then the top, I don't know, I think three qualified teams get a ticket to play at the Euro games and you have uh, different tiers. So the top tier is the champions league. Um, and then you have a second and third, um, and depending on how well you uh, you perform, you get a ticket to uh, to play uh, at a higher level, I guess, if you want to call it that. No, I got you. So then let's talk about what are some things that you're doing to identify these buckets, right? Because you talked a bit there about understanding what people need and how you know, you, you evolve the training based upon that. So what are some metrics that you're looking at? What are other than the RPE and what are some evaluatory tools that you're looking to implement with these young people so that you're able to then better prescribe what you're able to provide for them? Uh, yeah, again, a good question. <laughs> uh, with, the, with the three by three, we have uh, a lot of... Uh, pretty fancy equipment and we work a lot with data and there are my roles also data scientist where I assist uh, with the, with the assist Yuri as well, um, who was also on this podcast and some of the other coaches. With the handball, unfortunately, it's a bit of a smaller budget. So we are kind of limited in the, in the equipment that we have and we adjust our tests uh, towards that as well. So um, our, uh, what I use usually are pretty simple jump based tests or field based uh, field based tests. So uh, to name a few, um, I look at um, RSI uh, from a drop jump. Uh, I look at uh, counter movement jump height um, for the keepers uh, squat jump um, squat jump height uh, because uh, from analysis uh, we uh, noticed that they do most of their movements from um, from standstill, so without the count movement, so we adjusted that a little bit uh, towards that. Um, T-test, a little bit modified for handball, uh, is, a, is an agility, no, not an agility test, a change of direction test. Um, and uh, until now, we used, um, depending on time of the year, so sometimes in the, in the pre-season where we want to focus on um, developing the aerobic system, we did use mass uh, because the aerobic component is pretty big in handball as well, and it helps with programming. Um, so some th those are some of the the metrics that we used. We have our strength test as well, and um, yeah, I guess based on those, we we um, steer the programming a little bit towards um, who needs uh, who needs most of what. Um, and of course, the quality uh, quality uh, check. So during the tests, um, during the change of direction task, we try to look at the mechanics as well. And if someone needs a little bit more attention in uh, in that regard, then we add that a little bit in their warm up uh, to try to solve the that problem in a in the most efficient uh, way regarding uh, regarding energy, I guess. I like the addition of something in a warm up. Is there any chance you could maybe dive into that a little bit? Because I think that selfishly, like I stink at that. Like I'm just like, mm -hmm. like when we're running warm ups at practice, like we're going to do our four to six minutes of stuff. Now, I, with us, it's a little different because like we come in, we warm up for a training session and then we lift. 
and then we go to practice. So I guess it's a little different, you know, than, than what we're talking about here, but how are you manipulating what they're doing? How does that impact the group as well? Because I think that at times um, getting them into groups, especially when they're in the team setting where they're ready for the sport is kind of like a herding cat situation. Yeah, yeah, good points. Um, we actually try to add the, the warm-up part for their um, field-based, before the field-based sessions. Um, so that would be with some of the guys who, who we um, discussed with the staff that they needed a little bit more work on their change of direction, um, both technically and uh, output-wise. Um, we started that group a little bit earlier than the rest. And while well, the rest was doing their uh, first part of the warm-up, we, we did a part of change of direction work with them. So uh, let's say the practice starts at uh, six. They came 15 minutes early or a little bit earlier. Um, and then we did a 25 minute uh, change of direction session and they flowed. Uh, then they went, um, joined the group with the rest of the warm up where they do the throwing um, and, and the rest of the tasks. Uh, some of the younger ones also have a, a two techn technical sessions in the week, uh, separate from the rest of the group with the coach. Um, so that's a good moment where we sometimes also uh, uh, discuss how we can uh, how we can adjust the warm up to fit the current session. So uh, of course, there's always the question when you do closed uh, change of direction drills and mechanic uh, and, uh, mechanics work, will that eventually translate to the sport itself? That is much more chaotic. Um, I think that's a pretty good question. Um, I think that a lot of uh, a lot of people don't really focus on that as well because you see a lot of those great transformations from a couple of weeks training but a big question always remains will that transfer to the sport itself where you have a ball where you have an opponent um, and I think there's a higher chance of that transferring where you build your session up from bottom to top uh, where you start a little bit more isolated maybe hit some technical landmarks and then progress them into the session with a handball where preferably you would uh, also have drills that bias a certain um, certain execution that you also did in the warm up, um, And hopefully that primes them to do it there as well. Um, it's not always easy to evaluate, but I think when you stay, stay at the session, then you can also coach them through the technical uh, handball drills uh, with the same stuff that you mentioned earlier. Uh, and sometimes it also, uh, we also might use complexes, uh, which I think is a good way to uh, stimulate uh, learning as well, in the sense that uh, a lot of the drills that we use might not transfer directly, but they can give a, little, give a little bit more context on what you mean. They can let the athlete feel what you want them to feel. And then you can put them in another drill, which might be more specific, and you can tell them what you felt there. I want to see that here as well. So a kind of simple example of that would be uh, pogo jumps is something that's used a lot. Um, and when I want a little bit more pretension in their contact during a change of direction, I might let them do pogos, then go back to the other drill, then come back to pogos, come back to the other drill, um, and kind of coach them in the pogos and ask them if they could repeat the same feeling that they felt with the pogos when they're stacked. Um, uh, stack joints where you feel that fluidity in the air as well. Hit the hit the ground with pretension. Uh, make sure that their uh, that their foot is also ready to hit the ground. Okay, you feel that? Great. Can you also do that within the other drill? So th those are some of the things that we try to implement. I actually like that a lot, and I think that that's something that a lot of people talk about but i don't know if they necessarily do very well in practice and that is not just preparing them practice pun intended um not just that <clears throat> preparing them for the skill that they need to express during the competitive exercise but actually progressing that in a matter that we're building up a foundational ability to perform said skills. We're looking at the technical aspects or we're looking at 
typical movements that are involved in the skill that may or may not be lacking. And then working that back in with the skill as we go. Sounds pretty dynamic correspondence, Bondarchuki, if I've ever heard it. And I don't, I don't do that well enough. I think I do a pretty good job when it comes to like building that over time, but I don't think I do that well enough. And that's something that is definitely making me reflect a bit here about some things we're doing because that's a simple change too, right? That's like maybe like your springy guys, you need to make sure that they're doing some sort of bouncing activities so that they're prepared for basketball or handball. Or if you know that, you know, you're going to go right into defensive sets and hoops, maybe getting into some push to base, some side to side bounces, some bounding to the side and things of that nature are going to be important, let alone like maybe like some jump stops, you know, to get that D cell set in their head so that they're not just because of what you said, which I think is brilliant. Can you feel it in X and do it in Y? But just as a physical preparation standpoint, if you got to do it, you need to prepare yourself to do it. So why wouldn't you do it? Yeah, I think that's a pretty good way to look at it. Um, a lot of the things that prepare you are the, the thing that prepares you best is probably that thing itself or a version of it. Um, and a lot of those, those things that we use in the weight room might maybe be better suited for the, for the field sessions and the warm up where you can coach them through the movement as well, but at the same time, prepare them to do what they need to do afterwards. Um, yeah, I think I'm a pretty big fan of that and pretty big fan of plyometrics in general, because with plyometrics, you can, um, you can be pretty creative and find a variation of the movements that you want to, them to get better at and prepare them for within the practice. Uh, but you can make it a bit more coachable because once they have the ball in their hand, it's tough to coach those basic uh, basic things. But you can kind of prep them, coach them a little bit, play around with your center of mass uh, a bit playfully and then progress it towards uh, the more specific stuff where hopefully eventually uh, they'll take it with them uh, or just refer to it uh, uh, to the movement they did before that. Um, and in, in that sense, I think potentiation you can look at it from, from both sides, both from an output perspective, uh, neurally, but at the same time, it's, it's, of course, also getting that movement pattern in your head uh, and feeling that movement pattern um, and having it ready for, uh, for afterwards. Yeah, yeah, I think that's brilliant, man. I think that understanding that you now are not just It's very easy to get into the rut of basically, we're just gonna do like some movement prep stuff and get you out and practice and get out of the way. I'm guilty as charged, you know, especially when the basketball season starts in October and ends in April. Like it's real easy to do that. But when you really break down a couple simple things like you just mentioned and you can build in skill development and potentiation in five to 10 minutes and not have to rush. And especially if you're doing things before to get a move in, you can really take a bunch of that out. As long as you've got players who are going to dial it in and be part of it, you know, like if there are people that just, if that's not their thing, obviously that comes back to some different conversations, but I think that's really a great idea. Yeah, that's a, big, a good point as well. It depends. Uh, it depends on the group you have as well. Uh, some of the some of the older guys, um, yeah, maybe they've been doing their warm up for a certain way for a certain amount of time. Uh, I tend to leave them alone, uh, not completely, of course. You still coach them, but you might leave them a bit more um, in in what they find comfortable because they have to feel good for the training as well and. How much are you really going to change with those guys? Uh, the handball part is probably most important. While the younger guys are still fresh, are still ready to learn, and I'll I tend to go um, a little bit more towards them with my coaching as well. Yeah, it's hard to teach an old dog new tricks, especially when that <laughs> old dog has been successful. 
Exactly. That's the that's the most difficult part. When they're already been successful, then uh, it's it's sometimes a bit harder to uh, to get them to change. And maybe maybe they're right. Maybe we are wrong in that uh, that regard. Maybe they shouldn't change. Could be. Could be. Well, listen, Eddie, this is awesome stuff, buddy. But before we let you out of here, man, you put a lot of great stuff out too, content wise, sharing stuff so people can see what you're doing. Where can people keep up with you? Where can they see what you're doing? Where can they follow you and all those things? Uh, most active on Instagram um, with uh, hashtag, uh, or I mean hashtag, <laughs> at Profect Performance, uh, which is the name of uh, my company. Um, you can find me on there. I think that's that's where the most of the stuff is. I have a couple of blogs on my website, which are mostly a uh, little bit of rambling about uh, some of the thoughts that I just throw on paper, um, which is also probably how most of my posts look like. Um, I think of something uh, I, in my head, it's interesting. I throw it on a, in a post and uh, I hope that other people might find it interesting as well. Or maybe they think, uh, what a long story, uh, but a nice video. So they just uh, click the like button and not read it. Yeah, it's unfortunately, I think we run into that a little too much. <laughs> yeah, maybe. But no, buddy, listen, man, this is truly great. I truly am grateful for your time today. That I'm glad we could get this down. This is fantastic stuff. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. And uh, yeah, great. Hopefully it's uh, something... Uh, the people will like to listen to yeah man well i appreciate your time eddie man we'll be in touch real soon buddy cheers bye-bye